I made a presentation. I did some research over the summer about SDR and weather satellites. So um, I'm going to show you basically what I did for my research and my whole process and everything. So my name is Braden Warner. I'm a second year student uh, here at RIT. Um, I don't really have any like leadership experience with the club, but I did participate in uh, ISTS and U UB lockdown. So I've blue teamed a bit. Um, other clubs I've done, uh, swim team, I'm the president. So if you're interested in that, you can hit me up about that too, I guess. Um, on sh shameless plug right there. Um, I'm a member here in RIT sec and I'm also a member of uh, Formula SAE. Um, so my interests I listed, um, I like motorsports and racing. As you can see, there's me driving my cart, um, swimming, of course, and weather, which played a big part in uh, this whole research presentation and influencing like why I even wanted to do this in the first place. It was just a mix of multiple interests with uh, computers and weather. So that's really what inspired it in the first place. I also like music and stuff. So yeah, just add something else right there. So let's get right into it. What is SDR? So SDR stands for software defined radio. So it is a, you know, think of radio, it is software defined. So what you're doing is you're taking a lot of the parts in a normal like radio receiver and you're moving them to the software side of things. So that gives you a lot more flexibility with what you can do with it because you're not buying parts where it's not constrained. A lot of it is happening on the software side. So um, it, th this really makes it great, cheap entry into like the amateur radio world because, you know, you don't have to buy all these components. There's not all this stuff. You really just need uh, the SDR receiver that's, and then you need some antenna, some cable, and then you need some software to run it, which software is free. And so it's, it's just really easy access to start to saw the radio world if you're ever interested in that. Um, so on the screen I have at the top there. That's a SDR Sharp. That's the software that, that's a pretty common software that we, you would use with an SDR. As you can see, it's like a, it's called a waterfall display. So I tune to a certain frequency and it will show the, the gain or the reception at the different frequencies that you can see. And you can move it around, move it up or down. Um, at the top light, that's, that's what a picture of what the SDR I have looks like. They're pretty simple. It's just a USB with a, um, a coaxial it's called a SMA cable um, adapter that you just plug it into and you plug it straight in your computer. Sometimes you'll have to mess around with drivers and stuff to get it work, but it's pretty simple. Um, so also another big thing with SDR is what's called GNU radio. This is how a lot of people will manipulate signals and stuff that they're receiving. It's almost like a block shaped thing that people use and it's a it's a really useful it's really useful tool and it's really only used with sdr uh so that's cool and if you want to know what the basic sdr like structure looks like i put a picture down there you have an antenna you have an amplifier and it gets mixed into two separate channels pretty much and then it goes straight into an adc which is an analog to digital converter so it almost immediately goes right to digital and that will go straight to your computer. So it's a pretty software heavy design compared to uh, other radios and stuff like that. So what are the applications with radio? Cause that's kind of just what SDR is. It's just, it's just a radio. Um, for you know, any general radio communications, that's what I think of as like anything with like what you would call, I guess, a walkie talkie radio, a lot of police use it, firefighters, construction workers, weather, like a lot of different people use radio in that sense for, you know, voice communication from distance. And even with uh, like phones today and all that stuff, that's still getting used just because of how much, how it really fits the needs with uh, like voice communication from distance. Um, cellular, so 4G, 5G, 3G, that, that's, all, that's all radio. Um, and with the rise of IoT, obviously, like there's so many different wirelessly connected devices nowadays that, you know, it's starting to branch over into the, that's really branching in the radio world. Because when you have wireless Wi-Fi, anything with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, anything that's wirelessly connected, that is, that's radio. That's how it gets transmitted. Um, and satellite communications, that's what my presentation is really on. Um, 
they it, it's you you need some wireless communication scheme when you have basically a computer all the way or a tool all the way in space that's so far away you're not going to take an ethernet cable and connect it 200 miles away or 23,000 miles away that it doesn't work like that so you need some sort of wireless transmission and radio is the way to go recently they've been starting to use lasers but that is very new technology and that's not something i could have really dipped my foot into like radio so those are like some really big applications that radio has so i'm gonna just go over what's what gear i had so i had what's called an rtl sdr this is the most common sdr that it, it's out there i would say it's really cheap it's like 20 dollars and it's super easy to use there's tutorials online on how to use it and it has a lot of like community support because of how common it is. Um, that came with an antenna kit, V dipole kit, which basically is they're, they're like rabbit ear antennas. It's two different antennas connecting off to each other. You can adjust the angle or whatever. Um, um, I had two what are called low noise amplifiers, LNA. So what that does, they're basically just amplifiers. So it takes the signal in and it boosts it so it's a lot. So you get a better reception going into the SDR. They're called low noise amplifiers because they they don't really raise the noise floor, which is, you know, like when you turn it on and you don't have an antenna, it's the background. It's, it, if you look at the SDR sharp image where it's like flat, that's called the noise floor. So what it will do is it'll boost the signals coming in without raising that noise floor. And usually the LNAs are for specific frequency bands. So the two I had, I know they're for like 137 megahertz or and anywhere a couple megahertz higher or lower. So they really help if you're looking for a specific frequency, they will boost that specific frequency and block out all the other ones. So you don't get interference from things like radio towers as much because it's, it's effectively blocking that signal. Um, you do need cables um, to connect the satellite, like if you have antennas and all this stuff, they most of it is what's called an SMA cable. It's just a certain connector for a coaxial cable. Some of the other dishes will use bigger connectors and stuff, but you can usually get adapters. The big thing with cables with radio is that it does lose signal over distance or if you have cheaper cables. So you need to be mindful of what types of cables you're using, how long they are, because if you do something really wacky, you can mess up your signal and that will ruin your results sometimes. Um, I had a tripod, I guess. That was basically just for an antenna. And yeah, computer with SDR Sharp software and other tools. You really just need, I mean, once you have the SDR and you can just find tools online to help you, there's so many out there. You can also make your own. It's really flexible just because of how much of it is on the software side of things rather than hardware. So let's get into it. So now we are talking about the satellites that I tried to, you know, communicate with. So they're all weather satellites. And so the first ones we were talking about are the NOAA 15, 18, 19. They're, you know, 10, 20 years old. They are weather satellites, all three of them. And they are in what's called a polar orbit. It's low earth orbit. So they orbit from North Pole to South Pole, the, like that's their orbit, it's North Pole to South Pole. And what, what that does is as the Earth spins, it will cover the entire face of the Earth, which you can see on the map that I put right there. So that's what like the orbit path looks like through a day. So as the Earth spins and it's orbiting, it will cover the entire Earth. And that's really useful for weather satellites because they're just trying to get as much weather data as they can. They could focus on a specific area but it's much better to get the whole Earth covered. So there are three of them, 15, 18, 19. 18 and 19 are newer. They're pretty much the same thing. 15 is a little bit older. And the only reason it's still operational is because obviously there's two missing numbers, 16 and 17. Those are no longer operational. So they kind of kept 15 in there to cover things. Um, so all three of them, what I was going for were the images. So all of these weather satellites, they send images back to Earth. They broadcast it back to Earth. And basically, you can sit outside with the right antenna 
and at the right time when it's going over, you can pick up these images and compatible for APT and HRPT. I'll explain those later. APT stands for automatic picture transmission and HRPT stands for high resolution picture transmission. So they're transmitting images on two different protocols. And you, if you're, you're under the satellite at the right time, you can pick those up. So that's really cool. Now, these satellites aren't they're kind of outdated, as you can see by the dates. They're, the APT images are not great. They're not great. And so, but they're still orbiting and they're easy to pick up. And that's why for someone like me, these satellites were perfect. So how do you receive these images? So they're, let's, let's talk about the images, the APT images. They're four kilometers per pixel resolution. So. That might sound okay, but it's it's this is pretty low end for images in terms of resolution. They're they're pretty chunky, and the there's not there's no color information. They're visible. They're infrared passes. So what that means is is they're capturing capturing wavelengths of light that we don't even see ourselves. But the thing with that is is the infrared wavelengths are much better for capturing the the clouds from space. So you you'll be able to see the clouds a lot better with those infrared bands. And it captures it at two, which is not great either. Usually these satellites capture more than that. Um, also, cause there's three of them, there's what I would call a good pass each day. So when they're in low earth orbit, it's all about timing because you need to be, it needs to basically pass right over you to get a decent signal. And it needs to happen in the daytime because if it's at night, you can't, you can't see anything. So there's like two different things that have to happen for a good pass so you can actually get a usable image. And what's great that there are three of them is there's usually a good pass each day. You just have to figure out which one at which time and you have to be ready. It's a span of 20 minutes that will pass over and then it'll be done just like that. So you need to make sure it's, like, it's literally down to the second. So like they'll tell you we'll come above a certain place and it's always right. Um, yeah, these, these satellites are used for cloud cover from space. And they also, if there's smoke or something, a wildfire, they can pick that up too. Um, but these satellites are pretty outdated. So that's pretty much all they get. They pretty much just get cloud cover, which is useful for weather, but not great. And this all runs at 137 megahertz, which is pretty low. Um, so that also helps with reception stuff. So what antennas do you use? So as I was talking about that V dipole antenna I was talking about earlier, it's the one up top. It's basically just a V shape with like two protruding rods. And it's really simple and it's really good for picking up satellite images because of the, the way it receives a signal. It has to be a certain length and stuff, but it's really easy. You can pick them up. I bought a kit for it. So, or you can use QFH, which is quadrifilier helical antenna or something those are the best for this but you can't really buy those you have to build it and i didn't i didn't build one because i'm lazy i guess um so but they're really cool because they work from those antennas actually work from horizon horizon unlike the v dipole one so qfh is the best but if you have a v dipole that will work just fine too so let's talk about what this atp apt protocol is no it's not it's not some scary hacker group. It's actually automatic picture transmission. So it was created in 1963. It's really old. This is Cold War era technology, space race age technology. This was basically the first thing they used to even send images back from space. So it's, it's a fossil. And how it works is it continues. So what happens is as it's passing over the earth, it's scanning what's right below, below it and it's continuously sending that out. So wherever the satellite is over, that's the image, that's like the image you'll get at that time of like the lines and stuff. It doesn't like capture it and then send it, capture it, then send it. It's like scanning continuously and continuously sending it. So where you are in the world depends on what your image will look like. So if I'm in New York, my image will look different than I'm if I'm in Maryland, because when I'm in New York, you know, the signal will go a little bit further north and not as much south. So I'll get a different, cause it's scanning continuously. So I'll get like more of Canada and stuff but I won't get like Florida or anything because when I'm in New York, 
I'll lose reception while it's going over uh, a further south place. Um, resolution, so 128 lines long per frame. And these frames repeat, they're not, it's not like one frame and then you're done. They'll keep continuously repeating. And it's 2048 pixels wide. But a lot of that space of pixels is actually being used for what's sync. You can see in the image, there's sync, there's space markers, there's telemetry, only about 900 pixels each side. So like 1,800 pixels are being used for the actual video, the actual picture transmission. So the, the resolution isn't great. It, it, what it does is it separates these two video channels into like 909 pixels each. One is one infrared wavelength, the other is another infrared wavelength. And so you get two separate images in uh, one frame. And what you can do is you can combine them afterwards, process them, and it will give you a pretty decent image. Um, and uh, if you want to know what the waterfall, that's a big thing with signals, is looking at what the waterfall looks like. Right there, that's what the waterfall look like. What looks like it's a bunch of what I would call like, you know, pillars stacked pretty widely. So they're not very close to each other. Or anything. And it, if you when you when I'm receiving these signals, I look for that to know that I'm getting a good signal and it's the right satellite and stuff. So that's the APT protocol. It's very simple. And this was my setup. So. I went to a local park and I set up my antenna on my laptop 15 minutes early, just put slap that like that antenna right on a tripod, measured it out because they got to be the right length. And I plugged it in, waited, and I did get some weird looks, but this field was perfect because there was like not a lot of trees compared to where I lived. And it it got me some pretty good images and so that's what my setup looked like. Some people have automatic, so they'll mount it on the roof and they'll use a Raspberry Pi and it will automatically detect when there's a satellite going over. I didn't, I didn't do that. I just, whenever there's a pass, I was like, hey, I'll go to the park and bring my antenna and stuff. And so that's what my setup looked like. If you want to do this more seriously, maybe don't have it look like that, but it works. It worked totally fine. So here's like what a workflow of you know capturing these images and processing them looks like. So on the top we have the SDR and on the bottom we have a satellite tracking software. Those both go into the SDR software which is like the main it's like software that I would use. That's where it tunes the frequency, it captures it actually. And the Orbitron is really just controlling it and the SDR obviously has to send its signals in. And so what it would do is Orbitron, when the satellite is within a certain height of certain elevation, it would signal the SDR Sharp to start recording. It would be like, yo, so the, the satellite's overhead, start. And what Orbitron also does is it accounts for the Doppler effect, which I forgot to put on the slides. So the Doppler effect is when something's coming, it's like the thing you see in movies with the uh, with the ambulance. So when it's getting closer, it's higher pitched. When it's going away, it's lower pitched sounding. Same thing happens here with satellites. They're moving pretty fast. So what's happening is when the satellite is moving towards you, you'll actually have to be at a higher frequency to account for the Doppler effect or your pictures will come out like whack. So Orbitron not only signals SDR sharp, but it also adjusts the frequency so it's just right for where the satellite is in the sky. So that's really useful stuff. And then that all, all that gets piped into a decoder. You, I, used w, I used a certain one. You can find them online. There's multiple decoders. What it does is in real time, it will decode the image like line by line real time. So you can see if it's working or not. By the end, you'll be like, yay, it's done. And then it will go through all this processing to like combine the two images and add colors in the background, which weren't are actually there and all outlines. It just cleans up the image for you. So it's presentable. So finally, I've been talking about these images the whole time. Now time for the big reveal. They're not that good, but it's still cool. This was the first one that I did. I knew it wasn't going to be that great, but me seeing images come from space was pretty cool. So the first one on the left obviously isn't great. That one was my first one. I did it from my parents' bathroom window and I held my antenna outside 
for like five minutes. I was like, yo, that's insane. But, you know, I just had to put that one in there because that was cool. And then the middle one is probably the best one I got. The right one is I had some issues with some of my hardware and it was like flickering, but I got an image of a hurricane. I forget which one it was, but that was cool that I caught that with this one. So that's pretty much the, the color and the lines and stuff do not come with it. That is all image processing. Basically, the clouds and the ice that you see is all you get with these, but still, nonetheless, pretty cool. So that was the first satellite. Now we got another. I did three total. This is the second of three. So next satellite. This is the Meteor M2 satellite. Um, there's actually technically three of them. Um, as you can see, two of them don't work anymore. <laughs> They're Russian, so maybe that has something to do with it, but they're weather satellites for Russia. And what's diff it's also in a LEO polar orbit. So it's the same thing as the other one, but what's different is it operates on a different protocol. It's a little newer. So these images are a lot cleaner. Um, so that's really what you get with this satellite. But as you can see, I mean, they launched this one in 2014. Then the other one like blew up during orbit during launch. And then a third one, Meteor M2-2, did work for like three months, and then it got hit by a micrometeorite and failed completely. So there's only one of these left, but it does provide some pretty cool images. They're a lot cleaner. It runs on what's called LRPT. Um, I think that stands for low rate picture transmission. And it's they say low rate, but they're compared to APT, this is like fresh and clean. So this satellite was the next one I went for. How do you receive these images? So much better res resolution, one kilometer per pixel. That is crisp and clean. Um, so it's it transmits, I think it transmits like red, green, blue, and then near visible infrared. Um, and you combine all three or four of those and that will make the image. Um, the problem with this one is because two of them are dead there's only one good pass every like five days, which is so terrible. This was such a pain in the receiving process because I would do something and be like, oh, that's why it didn't work. And then I'd wait five days and then something else wouldn't work. And I'll be like, why didn't, oh, that's why that didn't work. So in whole, it took me like, I think a month and a half just to figure this stupid thing out. Um, but yeah, anyways. So this one, you do need one of those LNAs I was talking about, low noise amplifier to get a clean image. The broadcasting signal is not as strong. So you will need to amplify it in order to get a usable image because you want it to be, you want to have as little drops as possible. So you have to boost that signal to get these images. It's the same as the NOAA satellites in terms of frequency and it's also in low Earth orbit. So same same antennas will work for this one. You just need an amplifier. And yeah. So what does the LRPT protocol look like? Low rate picture transmission. Um, so that's the waterfall. It's similar to the APT one, except it's actually just way more tightly packed. So that transmitting more data, you need to have more, you know, more of that resolution. Um, as I already said, it's one kilometer per pixel. It actually has 10 bit color, which it doesn't matter, but it's still cool. Um, it was introduced as an update and a replacement to APT because that one obviously sucked. Well, it's old, it's really old. Um, but this one is really cool because it actually uses a packetized data stream unlike APT, which was like was pretty much analog. So this one, you'll actually have packets that will come in and you'll drop the packets. and. That I didn't expect that coming from space, you know. So that that was really cool. It has like all the different layers of that you need to unmodulate and process and stuff like that. And the biggest difference I'd say with LRPT to APT is it uses. So when you transmit a a signal, it needs to be modulated in a way. You need to transmit that wave. That wave needs to mean mean something. That's called modulation. It uses what's called QPSK modulation, which stands for Quatrature phase shift keying. Now this is a really, really, really important concept, like a huge concept in wireless transmission, huge. So how it works is you have two waves, IQ, I, 
focus on these two bottom images because this is going to be hard. I can't explain it very well. You have two different waves. You have I and Q. So what it does, phase shift king. So you have a cosine wave and a sine wave. You shift the phase. The, what, what it does is when the SDR receives signals, it adds those I and Q waves together. It does like sine plus cosine. Now what happens is, is you get the resulting signal wave. So you shift the phase of one of those waves to get a different resulting signal. So as you can see in the bottom right picture, you know, when they're, neither of them are shifted, that's considered a one and a one, and you'll get one resulting signal. Now, if you shift both of them, you get a zero and zero, and it'll result in a different signal. And then you can do that all the way, and basically you get, you know, a one, one, a zero, zero, a zero, one, a one, zero. And the way that they visualize this is with this circle. And it's basically a trig circle. It's a trig, like that's what it is. 45, it, it works the same way because it's sine and cosine. So when you, the resulting wave is 45 degrees off phase, it's 135 degrees off phase, 225 off phase, 315. That is how it works. And depending on what that resulting signal is, it will try to place it in one of those quadrants. And whatever quadrant it gets placed in, that's the resulting bits you'll get. You'll get, it basically combines the signals that it receives and it places it in a quadrant. And depending on where it is in the quadrant, that's what bit you get. And that's how it transmits the data. And it's, I was a terrible job at explaining, but that's how it works. So that's how, um, yeah, I think the next slide, no. So this protocol transmits at about like, I think they say it's 80 signs per second, which means you get 80 of those two bit combinations per second. So it transmits at 160 kilobits per second. Doesn't really matter, but when you're, use, when you're calculating speed with wireless signals, you also have to factor in how many symbols it sends. So if it's sending two bits, or four bits or however many bits, you have to add that to get the resulting data rate. So that's just another little note to confuse you guys more. Um, so here's the image workflow for the Meteor satellite. I put the LNA in there, woo! And then you have the SDR and the satellite tracker. Orbitron does the same thing as before with this satellite and they go into SDR sharp. Um, but now what we have is I had this plugin called Meteor Demodulator plugin. It's basically just a QPSK demodulator, it will show you in real time all four quadrants. So if you're getting very nice tight groupings in the quadrants, you know that you're getting clean data. And what that will do is I'll demodulate the signal and it will run it out to a different analyzer for LRPT. And it does it, it also does it in real time and it will also process the images for you so they look nice and clean and fun. So big review on this one. These are a lot better. Boom. So much cleaner. Um, because it's packetized, you get these like packet drops and it comes in with like these color errors. No, the earth does not look this green. That's just the look I went for. Um, but you can just you can just see how much cleaner the images are. You can actually see like <laughs> the land and you can actually see the clouds. They're not just like fizzles. Um, I caught that same hurricane on the left with it. Um, the middle one is probably the longest capture I got. I mean, that went from like all the way down to Cuba. There's actually another storm in the very bottom left corner, if you look at the middle picture. Um, and then the right one was by far the cleanest one I got. That was on a sunny day, as you can see. But it's so much more, it has to be so much more precise when you're running with this different protocol, because it's a lot more modern, it's packet based. So you have to have a really good reception. And fortunately, I did not. So much better images. And then we're going on to the third and final satellite that I grabbed images from. That would be GOES. So GOES is way different than the other two. It, it just is. It's, um, it's a geostationary um, satellite. So that means it sits in the same place in the sky always. Geostationary orbit means orbits at the same exact speed that the Earth rotates. So basically, as it's orbiting, it won't move relative to the Earth. So it will always be on the equator 
above on the equator at 75 degrees west. It will always be there because that's what its orbit does. And why that's useful is we can focus on one area of the earth now. Now that you know it doesn't have to go around the whole earth, we can just focus on the US and that's what they're for. They're the main US weather, weather satellites. You have goes west and goes east or goes, goes east is the one I was going for because I'm on the east coast. It's also known as goes 16. It's also known as goes R, but it's just goes east. Um, it has, it actually has sun facing and weather facing. So it actually captures images of the sun. It has other tools and stuff, but if you tune to the right frequency, you can grab images of the sun from it, which I didn't do, unfortunately. And it also has earth facing. So it has a camera, it has microwave radiation thing. It has all these different tools to measure a bunch of different things, but I really only cared about the camera because that's the coolest part, I think. Um, the camera it has the ABI captures in 16 different wavelengths. So it captures 16 different wavelengths of light. It's like all the way from blue, red, green, and then it does so many different ones to measure like ozone. It measures CO2, it measures moisture. There's so many different measurements that it picks up and it transmits all of them, which is really cool. Um, the protocol that it uses is HRIT, that's how it transmits the images. It's called high rate information transmission. And it has EMWIN, which is basically a space weather, like forecasting thing. Like that, I think EWIM is cool, but those are the two different protocols you, I was capturing on when I was, you know, capturing data from the satellite. So GOES images. So a big change we have here is you'll notice the, the frequency is way higher. It's 1.7 gigahertz, basically. That is really high. And that, that main means it's actually harder to pick up because of that, because those higher frequencies don't travel distances as well. Um, you, it's, it was really easy to figure out how to work it because unlike the meteor satellite where I had to wait every five freaking days just to be like, oh, that doesn't work. It's always there. Like I can just point, if I point my dish in the right spot, it's gonna pick it up. Like it will always be there. And if it's not picking it up, oh, then something's wrong. Super easy to figure out how to use, even though it's super sensitive. Um, you need an LNA. The meteor one, you could honestly get away with it. This one, no, you need to boost those signals. Those signals are so weak. They're, I mean, next next point, you need a dish too. You need a dish and an LNA. It's 35,000 kilometers away and it's at a higher frequency. It is a very weak signal compared to the other ones, which you could just put out some rabbit ears and be like, yeah. So this is that also means it's way more sensitive too. So what you do with this one is because it's not low earth orbit, you don't need to be super sporadic about it. You kind of just set it up and you leave it and it'll start gathering data and images. The images are way larger. So you kind of just need to leave it sit. I, when I did it, I'd leave it sit like two hours at a time, two hours. I think I did another time. I set it for like four or five hours for a time. This is another satellite where you could utilize like a Raspberry Pi and network access to do it you know, automate it rather than what I did, just sit in a tent for five hours, which was stupid looking back on it, but that works too. And you'll get some images. Um, the big toolkit I used for this was called Goes Tools. This is a very, very useful toolkit that a lot of people in the SDR community use to capture Goes images. Um, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Okay, I know you can't, if you can't read those images, don't worry, don't worry about them. I'm just showing you what it looks like. So you have two tools. Oh, I never explained what HRAT and EW. Oh, no, I'll do that in the next slide. So goes receive, takes those signals that I'm getting, and it demodulates them. And, it, and we have goes proc, and that's what it sends them to. So goes receive receives the signal. Goes proc processes the data that gets sent to it by goes receive. So goes receive sends the data. Goes proc processes it, and basically goes proc gives you your images straight into the folder and you can open them right there. It's really cool. So a couple things. So when you're capturing these signals, they are extremely sensitive. If you drop, this, this is also packet-based. So if you drop a single packet, that image is gone and it takes five, 10 minutes to get an image. So it needs to be like 
pretty much a perfect connection. I mean, they still have errors and stuff and it corrects those automatically, but if you drop a packet, that image is gone. It's all about having a low, what's called VIT, which is Vitter B error rate. That's basically how much error you get. With wireless transmission, you'll always be getting errors just because of how far it is, how what distance it's going. It's going through clouds and stuff. Um, usually they say that you want that above, below 400. Mine was running at about 112, 100. It was between like 100 and 150, which is perfect. I wasn't getting a lot of dropped packets. I was definitely getting some because whenever you drop one, it lets you know, like, yo, you dropped a packet. Idiot, now you don't got an image. And I was like, ugh. But, and then, so that's goes receive. Goes proc will take it in. It will process it in real time. It'll show you like the packet number, it'll count. And if it finds all the packets for an image, it will say writing and it will write that image. If you drop a packet, it'll say packet drop and it will wait for the next image basically. Um, Ghost proc also makes the images very pretty. It, it applies what's called a lookup table. It basically adds, makes the colors and it adds an outline and automatically sorts and labels. Ghost proc is awesome. So if you ever do this, check that toolkit out. It is great. It is one of the only one that's not deprecated too. So. Let's talk about HRAT and EWMIM. So that's what I'm actually receiving. What are they? HRAT is high rate information transmission. That's what it stands for. This is how you get the images. So it doesn't send, unlike the other ones, it sends one wavelength at a time. It doesn't send like all 16 at once. Like sometimes you'll get channel two, channel three, channel 15, channel zero. Like it sends down different images and it, it's on a rotating schedule if you look it up you can find it so you can kind of estimate what's going to be next um it's also packet based as you saw if you drop a packet fat l um, it uses what's called vdcu packets um and it uses it going back to if you remember whatever i said about qpsk it uses bpsk so what that means is it's the same thing binary so instead of having four quadrants you have two, so it's a lot more simple. It's the same concept, same concept, but you only have two quadrants. So I'm not gonna really go through, the, explain that again. It's, it's just binary. Um, it has a much higher data rate actually, 400 kilobits per second. I mean, these files are like, they're, I think they're five megabytes. That doesn't make sense. I don't know, but they're large files. And so you need a lot higher data rate to download those fast enough. And yeah, so then the other one you have is called EWMIN. It stands for Emergency Managers Weather Information Network. It's weather, it is weather forecast from space. Like I went, when I was receiving these, you get like images of the earth and stuff. And you're like, wow, really cool. And then you get a map of like temperatures and wave heights. And it's just like, what? It's like a forecast and they have like hurricane predictions. And I know they send, if there's a tsunami warning, they'll send a tsunami warning through that. They will send like legit weather forecasts from space down if you are if you happen to be looking at it. So like, if you happen to be looking at the GO satellite and there's a tsunami, you will get an emergency alert. Like, yo, watch out from like, tw from what was it? Like 35,000 kilometers away. It'll just be like, yo, there's a satellite, there's a tsunami. So that I think that's so wacky, but. I find it awesome. Um, so yeah, so those are the two different things we're capturing. I'll show you my setup now. So bonus dog pictures, that's the satellite dish. It's a grid fin dish. So it's not like a solid dish I usually see. It's, it's, it's grids, right? And um, so that is made specifically for the wavelength I was capturing at. And uh, you can see, so you can kind of see where the LNA goes. LNA goes right on the end of the antenna so it can boost that signal and push it down right into my laptop again with my fancy Intel stock heatsink cooler to keep my SDR nice and cool. And I basically just left it there and sat with it for like two hours the first time because I was like, yo, this is really cool. The second time I like set up a tent and just put my computer in the tent and like, I was like, whatever. And I'm just like, did my, went through my day and then I came back like five hours later. I was like, nice. And so, yeah, you just, if you're really doing this, you wanna always be getting images, you can just set one up with a Raspberry Pi, do it wirelessly. There are tutorials for, to, for you how to do it. And you can, you know, just constantly go through images. The one thing that isn't as cool about Goes 
is the other weather satellites, the images you get are completely unique to you because you're the only one in that position as it's going over. GOES is always in the same spot. So anyone who gets these images, they'll always look the same. And you can actually go to a website to look at them. Really cool if you Google GOES image viewer, the, the NOAA website will come right up and you can look at the images whenever you want. They're updated all the time. And yeah, so let's see what the images I got. These are awesome. So you get what's called full disk images. It's an image of that complete side of the earth. It sees the entire earth. And it also gives you zoomed in images every once in a while. Meteorologists, they'll, they'll give a spot every day for it to take zoom, zoomed in areas where they think there'll be thunderstorms, maybe tornadoes or a hurricane, like with the recent hurricane we just had. They will give GOES a small swath area and will send back zoomed in images from there. So you can see the one on the left, if I'm, I think that's band 13. So like of all the different wave lakes it captures, it's a 13. It basically just shows cloud height and moisture. And then the coolest ones is what's called sandwich. It takes the R, G and B and it combines them. And it, it looks beautiful. It really does. And these aren't the one on the right. You can't see the full resolution, but they're 5,000 by 5,000 images. They are ginormous. Also, if you let it sit for a day, you can get you can get um, some GIFs, you can combine them. That's how I say it. So you get the area where there are thunderstorms, you can see them popping up. You can see the, the earth rotating and the sun bouncing off of it. Another cool thing, the other goes west will sometimes communicate with goes east and you can actually get an image from goes west on goes east. So I got one of those, it only sent one, but it's still cool. You can see the other side of the earth. And on the left there, we have our, our weather management forecast, just in case you wanted to check the weather by pointing your satellite dish at a satellite. So, yep, that's pretty much everything I've come with today. Um, here's some sources. I'll post these slides and you can click on them. Those are all the sources I used. And all right, questions, if I'm ready for questions. Awesome. Cool. There's some great photos there, honestly. Very cool. Okay, so we have one. Um, mm -hmm says, is there a Wireshark equivalent for SDR? Um, for like packets? I don't think so. You can only see like the raw signals. I, I don't know if that's a meme question or not, but no, there is not. <laughs> I, I'm assuming that's not, but no, there's like no Wireshark for SDR. You cannot like capture packets uh, that I know of. There might be, but as far as I know, there's not. I think that's all the questions. I see some typing in, in Discord, honestly. So, what weather app do I use? I use windy.com or I uh, or I aim my satellite dish at the uh, Go satellite and I'm like, yo, it's going to be 70 degrees today. Cool. <laughs> oh my God. I still see typing. Typing, yeah. Is there any way to ensure packet capture, packet loss? So really what you want to do is you just want to make sure you have the strongest signal possible. There's a lot of error correction that I didn't look too much into going behind all that. So there is a lot of data that gets messed up. I know there's a couple different like algorithms of data that it sends to make sure that that data is all correct. I think dropped packets pretty much happen when too much of the packet is broken up. I don't know if there's any way to ensure that basically the best way to decrease is get a better signal. And how to set up a Raspberry Pi to that uh, USB. Um, there's tutorials online, you plug the SDR in and you, you can hook it up the same way that you do a computer. Can you use basic techniques to listen to view to other types of satellites? Yeah, I, I think someone said something about amateur satellites in like that orbit Earth, I'm assuming. You, you can do without like any tools. You can listen to like Morse code and stuff. You can tune in, but like for like images, it's kind of hard. You kind of have to download tools for that. Oh my God, I still see typing. You inspect all these questions, eh? I gotta, I gotta, I gotta wait. Repost louder, bro. Are there other satellites that you can listen to that face? I don't know. What? No, that like face as in look at space, like as in oriented to space. Um, not that I know of. I'm sure there are probably some telescopes you might be able to, but I don't think so. That, not that I know of, not that I've looked for. I looked for specifically facing the earth. 
Oh my god. Oh my god. So much typing. Hey, you gave a long, detailed presentation, man. It was yeah, great. I know. That was really long. I'm sorry. I stretched that out. No, there's no apologies. It was interesting. How much would different difficult would it be to send data to satellite? So one, I think that's illegal um, to even send data at all over radio on like certain frequencies. You do need a license, which I do not have. But like sending data to satellites is usually illegal and you probably shouldn't do that without permission. <laughs> for yeah i don't think there's any satellites that are like yo send some information to us you could probably look in amateur radio there yeah they probably have some sort of communication thing there but like weather satellites you're not just like a hey, send up some data to it i don't they don't know all right i think that's it i think that yeah the questions have come to an end <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you for such thank a detailed presentation. It's very interesting. Thank mm -hmm. you.